Good evening. The story is sad and all too familiar, and no one knows the story better than a woman who lived some 2,000 years ago in a village in northern Palestine. She made what she thought was a good decision to marry the man of her dreams, and at first everything was going smoothly. They were madly in love. But after some time, things hit a lull. At first, it was just general irritability. But after a while, conflict of opposing wills caused both of them to erupt in rage. They were no longer able to get along with one another, and so they felt the only thing left for them to do was to cut ties and move on. Failure is always tough, but especially when it comes to divorce, it's the worst kind of failure, perhaps. And it took her a long time to get past it, but eventually she was able to move on, and she met another man who seemed to be everything that she had been missing with her first marriage. And so after a while, they they got married, and again, things were, were great in the beginning, and then things started to fall apart. Same issues came up, and soon she was left with divorce number two. This time it didn't take as long to move on. She found someone pretty quickly, someone that seemed like Mr. Wright at the moment. They got married. This time she didn't even invite her family because she thought, well, if it doesn't work out, we can just get a divorce. And that's what happened. Divorce number three, and then four. And then five, until she met a man who was her sixth relationship, and they just decided not to get married. Why why go to all that trouble? Why bother with marriage? Because it's probably just going to end in divorce anyway. The woman I'm speaking of is the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And maybe her story didn't go exactly like I presented it. We could really only speculate about the details. But one thing is for certain. Her problem is all too common to the human experience. And I'm not talking about the multiple divorces. I'm talking about the longing for love and acceptance. I'm talking about the desperate attempt to find the source of fulfillment in life. And we can sympathize with her on that front, can we not? Because we've probably all been there, or maybe you're there at this moment. We understand her plight. How many of you have ever searched for the source of true satisfaction? I've told this story before a long time ago, but when Libby was in college at the University of Arkansas, she would get home really late some nights. And those nights, it was my responsibility to get the kids ready for bed. So we'd get their homework done, get them bathed and all that, and then I would tuck them into bed. And so one night, I had just finished tucking in Zane, and I got to my room and just got into bed myself, and he cries out, Dad, I yell back, what, son? He said, can you bring me some water? He's just stalling. I yell back, no, son, you need to go to sleep. A little while goes by, and I hear it again. Dad, this time I'm getting frustrated. I yell back in a rather terse tone, what, son, could you bring me some water? And I yell back, no, son, go to sleep, or I'm going to come in there and spank you. A little time goes by, and I hear it again, dad, this time I'm livid, what, son, when you come to spank me, can you bring me some water? (laughs) For Zane that night... It was physical water that he desperately needed. He had a physical thirst that needed to be quenched, he thought, or else he couldn't go forward. Remember the Sprite commercials? Image is nothing. Thirst is everything. Obey your thirst. And that's what many people do. Many people in our world drink up everything around them that they think will bring them fulfillment. I mean, why are extramarital affairs running rampant in our culture? Drugs, alcoholism is on the rise. 
People are trying to find the source of true fulfillment. Others look for it in pleasure or their work or or money or drowning themselves in entertainment. Whatever it is, we all thirst for something. And in John chapter 4, Jesus encounters a woman who is thirsty. Thirsty physically, yes, but more importantly, she was thirsty spiritually. Look there with me, beginning in verse 7 of John chapter 4. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman asked him, or said to him, How is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus replied to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but everyone who drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty, but the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Three things put this woman at a disadvantage, a severe disadvantage in her culture. First of all, she was a woman, and so women were not as highly apprised as they are in our culture today. They were not on equal footing with men. She was a Samaritan woman at that, and Samaritans were half-breeds, good for nothing, according to the Jews, and she was a sinful woman. So this put her at the bottom of the totem pole, the last rung, the bottom rung on the ladder. Now, it's unusual that Jesus would be talking to her because of these three things, but also because Jews would be considered unclean if they drank after a Samaritan. And Jewish men were not in the habit of asking Samaritan women for anything, much less a drink. But to Jesus, her image was nothing, and her thirst was everything. Though the woman knew Jesus was a Jew... She was unaware of his real identity. The giver of true fulfillment was standing right in front of her, and she didn't recognize him. Look at verse 9 again. So the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I'm a Samaritan woman? And just so you know, uh, they they put in parentheses, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus' response is crucial to understanding the rest of this conversation. Notice what he says. Jesus replied to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus wants this woman to know two things. Two things above all else. Number one, he wants her to know the gift of God. And number two, he wants her to know his true identity. So everything else that we see discussed here in John chapter 4, from this moment forward, circles back to those two things, the gift of God and Jesus' true identity. Jesus is trying to bring about a shift in focus. He's trying to show the woman that she's looking for spiritual satisfaction through physical means. The physical water from the well was only a metaphor for her life. She was actually seeking longing and acceptance, but she was seeking it in all the wrong places. She was attempting to fill the hole in her heart, the hole in her soul, with the things of this world. But it was a God-shaped hole, as it is for all of us. And Jesus is pointing that out to her. Notice verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty, but the water I will give him will become to him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. You cannot quench a spiritual thirst with physical water. Now, Jewish history tells us that this woman had a well that was right there close to her village, but she went out of her way to walk a further distance in the hot sun to get to another well. Why would she do that? Why would she take a longer trek to go to another well when there was one in close proximity? 
Maybe because she didn't want to endure the judgmental stares, the condemning whispers. Jesus comes to this woman when she's very vulnerable, and he's offering her water of a different kind, of a different quality, the kind that that would be undiminished, the kind of water that will bubble up within her soul to continually nourish her and satisfy her for eternity. That's the gift that the Messiah is offering to her. Remember, everything's going to circle around to these two things. This is the gift that he wants to offer is living water. But who does he have in mind? When he's talking about living water, we don't say what does he have in mind, but who does he have in mind? Jump over to chapter 7 of John, verse 39, and it says, But this he, Jesus, said in reference to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The living water here is the Holy Spirit. Those who believed, who repented and were baptized, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Once Jesus was glorified, the gift was given. We've mentioned this before. Glory or glorification is a major theme in the Gospel of John. And so we have to recognize that one of John's major focuses in his gospel is the glorification of Jesus. The Spirit is the gift that we receive at baptism. So Jesus' discussion with this woman is about the Spirit, the gift of God. Jesus is talking about receiving the Spirit, and then he talks about worshiping God in the Spirit. Let's keep reading. John 4, verses 15 and following. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw water. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have answered correctly, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have is not your husband. This which you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and yet you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one must worship. And Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from all the Jews. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, one speaking to you. So Jesus offered this woman something extraordinary. He offered her something that she could not find anywhere else, something that she desperately needed, and his offer certainly got her attention. Because anything that would keep her from having to go back and forth to this well on a daily basis would get your attention, right? And it certainly did hers. So she says, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And that's where Jesus flips the script, right? He completely changes course in the conversation and says, go call your husband. Why why would he do that? Why the change in tone at this point? He's talking about living water and then all of a sudden he directs the conversation towards her past. And of course she answers by saying, I I have no husband. And he says, yeah, you're right. You've, You've had more than one. You've had several. And in fact, you're living with a guy you're not married to currently. Why would he shift course at this point? Well, because she has to understand her need, doesn't she? I mean, you can't really accept this living water until you know you need it. Again, she had physical water on the brain. He's trying to to get her to come around to what she really needs and what will give her true satisfaction, which is living water. But before she can receive it, she has to know why she needs it. And so he exposes the ugliness that she would rather hide. She'd rather keep a mask on. But Jesus wants to remove the mask and expose her real need. And so he changes course in the conversation. He flips the script. And the reason why is because she could not keep going back to where she had always gone and yet have a change. 
You can't keep doing what you've always done and expect different results. For her to be convinced of her sin and her need for living water, Jesus had to expose the ugliness of her sin because that's the only way that she could find true fulfillment. Living water would do her no good unless she understood why she needed it and who was giving it. So Jesus isn't just offering a gift, he's revealing himself. Again, the Gospel of John is all about the identity of Jesus. It's about glorification. It's about glory. It's the reason that John wrote his Gospel. If you go to John chapter 20 and verse 31, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's a purpose statement in the Gospel of John. These things were written for this purpose, to reveal the identity of Jesus. You may not have been able to see or witness these miracles firsthand. You may not have seen him turn the water into wine and all those different things, but you can know because they have been recorded for your benefit. Even though you weren't there firsthand, you can still benefit from the account. If you're tuning in to the Dear Church podcast, Blake and I have been talking about apologetics over the last few weeks, and we'll continue to do so as we record another episode tomorrow. And one of the things that we talked about uh, in the first episode is how faith is not blind. Blind faith is an oxymoron. And nowhere in the Bible did Jesus ever ask anyone to follow blindly. Never. Never did he say to people, hey, just, just follow. We'll figure it out as we go along. Trust me. You know what he always did? He always said, consider the evidence. Remember when John the Baptist was sitting in prison, he was about to be beheaded, and he started getting concerned, maybe needing some confirmation. He sent a couple of his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you really the expected one? A term that he actually used prior, but he just wanted to make sure. And Jesus doesn't say, yeah, go back and tell him, you don't have to worry. I am the expected one. Quit worrying yourself about this. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus tells those two disciples, you go back and tell John, what you've seen. Remind him what he's seen. Consider the evidence. Jesus always said that. Consider that. There's no such thing as blind faith. Consider the evidence. And that's what John's gospel does. It presents us with evidence. And you can consider the evidence and you can go full force following Jesus, knowing that these things that are written are true. Or you can choose not to believe it and go another direction choice is yours, but consider the evidence because the evidence overwhelmingly points to Jesus being the Messiah and as recorded here in the Gospel of John, he is the way, the truth, and the life. The fact that Jesus is the Christ is the great truth of the Gospel. Jesus is the truth that sets men free. He is the way, the truth, and the life, as we just said. Throughout the Gospels, we see that he is indeed the truth that people must believe in in order to be rescued from their sins. Even in John chapter 18, there's this pivotal scene in the gospel where Jesus is before Pilate. Remember that episode in the praetorium? You say secretly that I am a king. For this purpose, I have been born. For this, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate responds with, what is truth? It was standing right in front of him. How could he miss it? He says, what is truth? But you've heard me say it before. Truth isn't a what. It's a who. Truth isn't doctrine or theology. If it were, Jesus would not have had to die. Truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ. And one of the major themes in the Gospel of John is to reveal the truth, the identity of Jesus. So, what does all of this have to do With John 4.24, we've been looking at some of the more misused and abused pieces of Scripture. Maybe this one isn't so much abused as it is just simply taken out of context. A lot of times we pull John 4.24 out of this greater context of the woman at the well, and we say that it's important to worship God in spirit and in truth, which it is. And what do we say spirit and truth is? Well, you worship with the right attitude, and you worship by the rules. That's what it means. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's not the conversation Jesus is having here. You can find other places in Scripture that either by command or example show us how we are to worship. 
Certainly we see that attitude and heart matters because Jesus even uh, in Matthew chapter 15 talked about vain worship. And we're going to talk about that in our Sunday morning series. There are other places that you can go to to talk about the attitude and the rules, so to speak, when it comes to worship. That's not the conversation that Jesus is having here. When he's talking to the woman at the well, it's in the greater context of those two questions that we talked about. Who is Jesus? What is his identity? And what is the gift that he came to give? We see this play out in the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost... The Spirit was poured out like living water on the apostles who were baptized in the name of Jesus. Soon after, the truth of Jesus was spread throughout Jerusalem. I should say the living water uh, was, was poured out on the apostles and those who were baptized in the name of Jesus. But soon after that, the truth of Jesus was spread throughout Jerusalem and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. Now God had a multitude of worshipers, both Jew and Gentile, who did not worship exclusively in Jerusalem or Samaria, but as Paul put it, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and take pride in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The Spirit in whom we worship is the Holy Spirit, the gift we receive at baptism. And the truth in which we worship is the identity of Jesus Christ. We worship in spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and we worship in truth. The Messiah, the Christ, the one who gives living water. That's the context of Jesus' words here at this well as he talks to this woman. But before we leave that story... I want you to make note of one more thing. After her encounter with Jesus, after he spoke the truth to her in love, after he opened her eyes to her spiritual need, the Bible says that she left her water pot and went into the city. Why is that significant? She left her water pot because she didn't need it anymore. It was a metaphor for her life. She no longer needed that water pot. She went into the city to tell anyone who would listen that that she had seen who she believed to be the Messiah. Come and see the one that she had met. It's important, yet it's often overlooked. The fact that she left this water pot, she left it unfilled. Why? Because she had been filled. She had found what she was looking for. Symbolically, she didn't need that water pot anymore. Her thirst was quenched. She found fulfillment. She found living water. And that's all she really needed anyway. And that's all you need. Go to Psalm 42. David writes, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? I remember these things and pour out my soul within me. David wrote these words from his own personal ground zero. He was desperate and he was searching. He longed for true fulfillment and satisfaction. And notice that he longed and thirsted for God and his presence. And notice what part of him was thirsty. Not his mouth, not his throat. His soul, as the deer pants for water, so David's soul panted for God. Because David knew that it was his soul that needed satisfying. Above all else, it was his soul that needed to be quenched. And therefore, he sought God with everything that he had. And we must do the same. So let me leave you with a few questions. Are you thirsty? Does your soul long for something more? Is there a God-shaped hole in your heart, in your soul? And if so, I would tell you to do like the Samaritan woman did. Leave your water pot. Come to the fountain. Come to Christ, the source of living water. Clinton has a song picked out for us. If we can help you tonight, why don't you come as we stand? And as we sing.